Good morning. You're listening to Conversations with Lulu. I'm Lulu Khazan, an entrepreneur living in Dubai, an investor, a mother, and your host. My guest today is a hardworking, brilliant, and humble man who I'm proud to call a friend. Abdel Aziz al Lughani is a serial entrepreneur and a successful one at that. He co-founded and managed Talabat.com, which ultimately got acquired by Rocket Internet for $170 million in 2015. And he's currently the co-founder and CEO of Flowered, which is a flowers and gifts e-commerce platform with big, big plans to eventually IPO. In parallel, he also co-founded Faith Capital, which is a venture capital practice focusing on investing in the GCC. By every description, Abdel Aziz is a powerhouse. He has even helped shape the Kuwaiti government's strategy towards entrepreneurship in SMEs. You can read his full extensive bio in the show notes. So, Abdel Aziz, I'm so happy that you uh, finally agreed to do this with me. And I want to welcome you and ask you, how are you? Thank you, Lulu. It's been, uh, we've had many of these conversations, I would say over the past maybe uh, six, seven years, uh, but it's good to document them somewhere. Uh, thanks for your uh, efforts. Thanks yes. for uh, bringing a lot of great stories uh, online through your podcast. And I really enjoy watching them. Yeah, Abdel Aziz, you're, you're actually one of the few people who's not always out there uh, in the events and, and uh, on stages and in the press and the media. You're one of the uh, very successful but silent, uh, let's say, uh, behind the scenes kind of guy. Is, is that on purpose? Yeah, so there's a saying in, uh, in the Valley, you're as good as what your last deal is, right? Uh, I remember uh, in our... Uh, conversation earlier last week you were noting to me now why aren't you writing anymore um, I, I don't tweet I don't write as much as I used to I think uh, as you become maybe uh, maybe the word is more mature you find less value to bring out to people right less uh, value less why? Value. <laughs> less, uh, <laughs> Because anything you find online is uh, is available for people, right? So unless you're going to come out with something that's actually genuine, um, maybe that's why I start. I still write, I still publish, but it's a lot less uh, than it used to be. So, um, so you feel already already a lot of it has been covered. I do feel a lot of it has been covered. Yes, I do feel. Uh, but but you, I, you bring a unique view, though, from the, uh, I mean, from the Kuwaiti ecosystem first uh, and from the GCC side. Yes, I, mean, I think the size of our community, despite having a 450 million population in the Arab world, but the size of the community is relatively small. And many of us already know, uh, know each other. Uh, I'll, I'll probably... Uh, I'll, you inspired me to write something actually earlier last week, and maybe we'll uh, we'll zoom into that uh, into a conversation. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm I'm so happy to hear. You know, you're the second person that says this. There's one person whom I'm interviewed, and he told me uh, he told me you've inspired me to start my own podcast. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's that's good. That's good. So. Uh, I, I read some of your writing actually on uh, on uh, on Medium. You have published some posts, and uh, and you have some really really excellent uh, uh, articles. It's a few, but uh, but I think you should definitely write more. What are you writing about? So, uh, I think one one topic that is uh, concerning and alarming to me today is is the amount of media and publicity uh, investors and VCs have in this part of the world. Uh, if you look at the founder's journey, uh, those who actually made it big, big either in IPOing, exiting, or even just generating very high revenues, uh, it saddens me that the founders actually get very little credit of that story. And most of the uh, publicity and PR goes for the investors. It's as if the investors built the company when they've actually only written a check, right, in many cases. Okay, uh, and you feel that, that, that it's the case here or you're talking uh, in I, general? Yeah, I think in this part of the world, 
Um, the value add of VC funds is, uh, is questionable. Uh, I think they are very mindful. Well, I myself am an investor, but I'm unable to provide the value I wish I would uh, provide as a VC professional because I'm not there yet, right? You're well, not? I'm not there yet. I can't do that. This is why I don't manage fiduciary money. Uh, I purely invest. In also, my faith, faith Capital is, uh, is personal funds. It's uh, my partner and I, his family were very uh, supportive of the efforts we had. Uh, it's a holding co, and we invest only from our uh, balance sheet. I see. The uh, reason being is we, we don't, I don't believe that I can add uh, the value I wish for uh, today uh, because of my dedication and commitment to Flower. Uh, I think that generally speaking, VCs are mindful and that they can add a lot more value to the portfolio companies they are investing in. So, uh, that uh, that comes in the form of uh, technical and strategic guidance through real generate and yeah, value generation teams. Contribution to top line should not be well uh, introductions, cold emails, or phone calls. They should be yeah any opening up significant shelf uh, space for their product and services to be uh, distributed at at scale. Uh, we need to access proper talent. This is not just a local, regional uh, challenge. This is a global challenge right now, right? But I think, yeah, I mean, if, if you just, uh, obviously, in addition to contribution to of, of capital, yeah, I mean, money-wise, but I think the capital part is pretty much uh, covered. But when you take a deeper dive in how much of technical and strategic guidance is being added, uh, I feel more. I feel. I think, and I know great uh, VCs in this part of the world, but the value is very much limited to one or two people in that uh, in that fund. And if you distribute that at a 30, 40 portfolio companies, I mean, you do the math. How much value can you really add? Like, do you feel it's maybe a fund size issue? Uh, that maybe they can't necessarily afford to hire uh, uh, people that like a big support team, or or maybe they don't see that it's um, that it's their job to provide this kind of support. Yeah. Okay. So there are two folds, right? One is the value add you're getting from a VC, and then the second part is the publicity and PR that I feel founders are undermined with. Okay, uh, on the VC side, I think they're very mindful and they need, they would like to add more value. Uh, but given the sizes of AUMs, you know, without sovereigns really moving the needle, it's very hard for VC funds to also uh, attract the right talent that would add value to those portfolio companies. Uh, I think that's one fold of the problem. Number two, it's the, uh, you know, there are probably a handful with real entrepreneurial experience, but most of the VCs in the region are pure uh, finance and investment bankers, right? Uh, they, they would probably you know, design or, or architect a good term sheet. But beyond that, uh, I mean, we've all listened to conversations of, uh, of investment professionals that that when you speak operationally or try relating to logistics, customer care, marketing, operations, fulfillment, this is like, يعني, it's like when you're in school and your decision risk analysis professor tries talking to you about your gut feeling, how, how worthless it is uh, in, in doing business, when in reality, uh, without this gut feeling, no matter how much research you do, if you just do, if, if you try executing without that strong gut feeling, Hannah, to me, it's uh, it's worthless, right? But it's like a professor teaching you how to do business how in the real world. Entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that's a feeling I get in uh, in a lot of the time. So this is why I feel. And, uh, and the VCs, uh, 
are aware and that they need to add a lot more value than what they're currently providing. And I believe that some of them have already started acting on it, which is, which is great. Uh, but I would uh, also say that a majority of them uh, and, and they cut the crap and just be more direct uh, and, and say it out loud and be bold, have the balls to say it. And all I won't add beyond capital anything to you. Just be, be straightforward, right? Rather than promise me the sun, the moon, and then... <laughs> it's and difficult then. Uh, for them to differentiate to differentiate themselves though, right? Because in, initially, like when I started fundraising in, in 2012, there were only like three or four. Now right. there's obviously more, not still not too many, but uh, but there's more. And uh, and how do they differentiate themselves, right? And everybody says, we love founders or we invest in great founders. Well, who wants to invest in a, in a, in a, in a bad founder anyway? Uh, right. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think- But like, how would you differentiate yourself then as a, as a VC? I think it's the conversation you have with the founder, right? Yani, I know, amongst the one of my best, honestly, best experiences I've had in the region is a retreat with the 500 startups uh, companies uh, that I had uh, I had the privilege to attend last year, 2019, and it was it was for me mind blowing. And the conversations you have are real, are tangible, are challenges or experiences that that you as a founder uh, face firsthand, rather than someone talk to you about it from reading an Andreessen Horowitz or, or sorry Ben Horowitz book, right? When in reality that's the closest thing to reality he's ever or she's ever uh, touched, right? So what was the what was the format? The format of the retreat was uh, a lot of panels, but beyond the panels, it's the side conversations that you had for a weekend. And, uh, and I felt it was very, very enriching because it's a two-way kind of learning uh, format. And you get to meet a lot of great founders that uh, in some cases uh, you're learning from and other cases sharing your insights with who I feel in the, uh, in the VCs actually uh, miss that. Then if you look at the... So, the, oh, so there were no VCs? It was the only there are VCs, founders? But the, there are VCs, but beyond the funding conversation, there aren't any conversations, right? And I think okay. that's how you can really differentiate yourself. It's your ability to learn. But even when it comes to them having conversations on tools, for example, uh, they're, they're outdated, right? They still talk about heat maps. Uh, obviously, I mean, uh, obviously, they're outdated. And I think that your, your ability to bridge that, uh, that academia uh, school <laughs> versus the practical, more vocational uh, execution is is the best value you can bring. So, so, so what you're saying is uh, is is be humble, basically, and uh, and acknowledge your strengths and weaknesses as a as a VC, hey. uh, and don't overstate, uh, let's say, your uh, your strength. Yes, but this has a part. Be honest. Uh, this is the first part about VCs, right? And then the other part is about founders, because I feel they are they are not given the right attention, and it's the founders who have gone through the hard times, the good times, all the real learnings, right? Instead of walking into, uh, yani, without naming any conferences, this most regional conferences, the key panelists, the keynotes. And the biggest uh, panels almost always end up going for investors. And in reality, if I were a founder attending one of those sessions, I would want to have a chat with with Lulu and tell me how did Nebbish end up getting acquired uh, with your announcement this week, right? Uh, how, what kind of challenges were you going through in the past three years, right? 
Um, I think, you know, for your point, I mean, I've seen, to be honest, to be fair, I've seen, I've seen entrepreneurs on, on panels, but I've seen the same entrepreneurs on panels. That's the issue. So, so usually when you go out to these events, there's the usual suspects, the, the usual people from the VCs and the usual, uh, there's a couple of entrepreneurs. I was one of them at some point. So I want to be, I want to be honest here. I don't want to be uh, uh, like uh, a hypocrite. Um, you know, at, at the time when I launched, uh, founded Nebbish in 2012, there was a lot of uh, press. And sometimes as a founder, you get sucked in. Honestly, I like sometimes you, you know, in hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have done all of these panels and conferences, but, but I didn't know any better at the time. So, so uh, I don't know, what, what, what was I trying to say? I forgot my point. But I think, I think it's usually the same people. That's what I'm trying to say. And if you're, you know, if you're like a Kareem, for example, like if you're a Mudassar, yes, of course, everybody's going to want to talk to you. And fair enough, obviously, you've done a m massive achievement. Uh, but there's a lot of others that don't really get the, the any share of voice, as you said. And and it ha it doesn't need to be only on a regional magnitude. If you just zoom into your local community, and and uh, just you're under right. Yeah, and you, there are founders in Saudi Arabia who've been there for the past six, seven, eight years, and I can almost guarantee you that VC funds that are a year old are today a lot more popular than all of these founders. You're right. Imagine, within You're a year, right. Wallah, I don't Chinese VC. Yeah. It's like talking Chinese to him. Yeah. And he's now, yeah, and he, uh, I feel in uh, this, this amplifying, this uh, yeah, any big echo around VCs is, uh, is good it creates more awareness obviously hopefully making your pipeline a lot uh, a lot stronger but i feel that a lot of journeys a lot of mentors should actually be the founders themselves uh, rather than uh, an investment professional whom uh, a year ago was only talking about bonds and today is trying to teach us how to scale uh, an online business with an attitude with, with an attitude with an attitude <laughs> you know um i spoke to someone who uh, who who recently uh, actually he's been a vc but uh, he's recently launched a, a new fund and i was having a chat with him and i was asking him you know what are like what are you trying to change what are you going to do differently and he mentioned something which i found interesting he said that usually vcs get all the credit and the LPs, the limited partners, the people that actually fund these funds, don't get any credit. Yes. And now you're saying also that maybe the founders themselves don't really get that much credit. So, so, uh, so, so, how how do you solve this? <laughs> I, I think we need to be more. Uh, we need to be more conscious. We need maybe to start talking about media outlets and highlight to them the real learnings. Uh, I think that the, yeah, what maybe some, maybe we need to write more, right? And uh, kind of take notes about history. And if you did a story, there's a lot you can write about as a founder. Uh, instead of wait for someone like uh, Chris, whom you've interviewed, to take the time and actually write about you. <laughs> write a book. <laughs> Hey, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and I, feel, I, th I feel that, yes, ourselves as founders or investors, we can, we can definitely take more time and, and start really uh, noting our history. So you, yeah. you should continue your writing. You I, I am. I'm going to write about those pieces. We, we started this conversation by saying you've, uh, you, you, you don't have any more value to offer. So there you go. There is a lot. I hope so. I hope so. So, so how, how are things at Flowered? I mean, last time you and I spoke, I mean, you 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 joined uh, two years ago. Yes, yes. So uh, I invested in this company uh, around two and a half uh, years ago. It was a small uh, company called Q8Flowers.com. Uh, it was three years ago. And uh, management back then uh, did not feel that they are ready to take this uh, journey forward as, as we had uh, uh, invested in. 
I found myself still wanting to go through this journey again. Uh, <laughs> I rolled up my sleeves and uh, here I am. So fast forward two years and a half, we obviously started a new company with a new brand. Uh, QH Flowers was quite limiting uh, in, in our expansion plan. So we called it Flowered. Men flowers word. Word of flower, okay. <laughs> yes. so, so word is a, a flower in Arabic for... Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, it's full-fledged e-commerce. Uh, we think two key reasons were behind our decision to do that, not a marketplace. Number one is uh, customer experience. Uh, because you're not really purchasing for your own use, it's most of the time gifting someone. So you have two customers and there is just so much, uh, uh, so much yeah, I mean, uh, mis-expectation management that happens uh, on, on marketplaces. Uh, so having full control over your experience uh, was very important to us. Well, number two, unit economics. Um, if you take the lifetime value of a flower purchaser uh, and only take like a 10% margin of that, you end up with a very small lifetime value uh, as a company for each customer. So owning the full margin, uh, with the exception of maybe uh, growing our own flowers in different farms, maybe that's the only supply chain exception we don't have. The rest of the supply chain is, is fully in-house, all the way to the last mile delivery. Well, and, and you spoke about lifetime value of a, of a flower customer. I yes. assume someone that buys flowers, buys flowers for quite some time, right? Yes, around 12 years, 12 to 14 years, actually. 12 to 14 years. Yes. Uh, and then what, he doesn't buy his wife flowers anymore <laughs> after that? <laughs> um, so so in, uh, it's interesting. And, uh, you're absolutely right. The culture in our part. I am right. Okay. It, it's gifting, right? Uh, whereas the culture and uh, consumer behavior in, in Europe or in the US is more actually for personal consumption. But it's yeah. the product they want to keep in the, in the house. It's not, well, uh, occasionally on your birthday or so. So, uh, what got you excited? I mean, you you were investing at the time, and you had, you know, we, talk, we always talk about opportunity cost, right? You can you can put your time in this or in that, or or like I'm sure after your uh, uh, you know your your successes and uh, and uh, Talabat, even though you had left by the time they exited, but still you were part of the company, and so. Uh, why did you choose uh, to spend your time and put your effort like in flower, like in flowers? Is there what's the reason? Is it the reason? Is it like a, you like flowers or you find it's a good business to be in? Okay, so um, uh, three reasons, honestly. Um, flowers was not any of them. Uh, to me, <laughs> it, it's the passion to really create and deliver a great. Uh, value proposition in the communities we live in. Uh, that's the kind of the key drive. But on top of that, um, number one, and alhamdulillah, I, I was a millionaire by 26, right? But I didn't, I learned a lot after Talabat, right? But I, I, the investors were not as friendly as they are today. You think they're friendly today? <laughs> I, I think the terms have changed and are skewed better towards the entrepreneur when it comes to uh, valuations and firm belief in the founder's uh, alignment of interest long term. Um, oh, I think that's generally been part of the awareness that has been created uh, in the ecosystem over the past 10 years. Well, there's a bit more competition now as well. There's more money competing on, okay. on startups. Okay. Okay. Uh, for mind, mindful of that, for number one, uh, I feel that uh, I still have the energy or passion to actually go through this journey again. Uh, number two, um, there aren't so many serial entrepreneurs in the region, right? Oh, I think while we have that energy, 
it's it's really worth and that we put our minds to to a cause we we feel there is a great opportunity to uh, and hopefully uh, make it big it doesn't need to end up with an exit or uh, or, or an ipo this uh, the scale and the magnitude uh, we think of with the mindset we come with today is very different the learnings the experience we have today is very different from my time in Talabat in 2007, for example, right? Or 2008, with a 9, with a 10. Um, oh, oh, lastly, it is a big market, right? So Cut Flowers is a $1.5 billion market in Khalid, on its own. Oh, 90, yes, in the Gulf. And 99% of that is offline. Oh, there are local attempts for uh, online flower uh, destinations, but there's no real market leader who's basically monopolized this industry yet. So after operating uh, operating for two years right now, two years and a half, uh, we're, we're really proud. We have a strong, very strong dominant position in every market we operate in. So this is primarily why it, it's led us to uh, start thinking and then we expand beyond the region. So hopefully by by end of 2020, we would be covering all the major cities in the Gulf. And then uh, Q1 2021, uh, you'll hopefully see us in, uh, in other continents. I hope. So is this, is this what drives you? Um, it is. It, it, it really is. I feel, I feel that uh, I feel that independent wealth creation as an entrepreneur is something uh, is, is definitely faster uh, if executed properly than any other asset class. Uh, or, or I think I also, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, stories fill in history books, money fill in your bank account. Filling in your bank account lets you do what you really and ultimately want to do. Helps you create the real impact you want to have rather than wait on well, the governments or investors for them to help you do that, right? But I think being more and I'm conscious in the self-interest is at the end of the day what I'm after, which hopefully translates to more public interest. But I think filling in my bank account today is uh, is important so that I can hopefully move on to more uh, more developmental uh, kind of efforts later on in my life. We clearly seem to enjoy the growth, uh, like the start and the the, the growth phase. Uh, I, I mean, clearly you're not in it because of your passion for flowers. So, uh, so, so it's, so you know what, that's actually good advice. I mean, you, you hear all of this advice all the time, follow your passion and like, uh, you know what I mean? Like solve a problem that you, that you're facing and all of that, but look at you. I mean, there you go. You looked at something very opportunistically. Here's a big market, very fragmented. Right? I, I tend to believe that honestly. And, uh, if I were to double click on what you just said, in terms of opportunities for founders, we are a $3.5 trillion economy in the Arab world, of which 29 billion is only online. Well, from that 20 wow. billion, it's, so it's less than a fraction of, of a percentage, right? And of that 29 billion, 21 billion is hotels and travel. And then-, and then Hotels they, and uh, what? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Hotels, hotels then? and travel. And? Travel. Travel, okay, okay. Yes. And then Which is now non existent, actually, almost. Uh, and then you have uh, fashion, you have consumer electronics, you have, you have food and beverage. <laughs> but the rest is a desert. Seriously, a desert. Yani any other industry or vertical is relatively nascent online. I'm sure you'll have attempts uh, in, in different countries, but in terms of having that dominant lion's share market position, no. 
there are so many other opportunities. I'm, I'm investing, we continue to invest in those. But I feel... <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Oh, no. uh, but I feel that having that bird's eye view uh, and understanding what the real opportunities are, there are so many low-hanging fruits that don't really need your uh, AI and big data or virtual reality or augmented. Yeah, and fine, these emerging technologies obviously are important, but in our part of the world, there are so many low-hanging fruits. Can you give an example? Uh, yes, uh, and it's eyewear. Uh, eyewear, okay. Eyewear. Uh, whether it's contact lenses or uh, yeah, any glass, sunglasses or uh, medical ones. There is uh, a startup now trying to, to tackle this. There you go. Did you invest in it? Yes, I did. Ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, so there are glasses, there are uh, laundries, there are water sports, there are obviously groceries has become a lot more, uh, is picked up significantly, especially yeah. during the COVID uh, yeah. crisis. For, for so many verticals, yeah, um, ad networks. Ad networks. Huge market. There are so many native apps that yeah, I mean, today depend solely on really big ad networks, global ad, ad networks. But in this part of the world, it's, uh, it's empty. It's empty. Yeah, I mean, why wouldn't someone come up and say, well, I want to hook up all these apps, Nebbish or Flower, do all the others, and uh, I want to start an ad network around them. I'll buy the real estate. Well, I'll sublease it to X and Y and Z. Pets is another example. Um, there's a company I'm, uh, I'm currently actually looking at uh, for pet supplies. I think we spoke about it, you and I. Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but, we did. But, I mean, there are so many verticals that are still untapped. If you just keep an eye out, I don't feel that you need to relate so much to the product or service itself. Do you feel entrepreneur maybe, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, you were trying to convince me to to uh, launch a new startup, basically, and, and to, to, to stay an entrepreneur, which, uh, which, uh, which I'm considering. Do you uh, feel founders today try to, especially maybe in this region, because you know, blockchain, AI, and all of that stuff is very uh, sexy in, 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 the, in the Western world. Maybe they feel like if they go with, uh, I don't know, a pet, uh, you know, a pet uh, startup or something, it might not be as glamorous or as uh, exciting maybe to VCs here or, or because I, I, I mean, I'm not a VC, so I don't know how they think or what they look for. Yeah, so, so it's for me, honestly, and uh, a lot of the VCs are, dear friends of mine, uh, we speak regularly, I co-invest, you know, my partner and I through Faith Capital, we co-invest in Arad. And uh, size matters, right? And if you look at the biggest startups of the region, they're not doing something uh, disrupting uh, the, the, the globe, right? Uh, they are just executing very established uh, ideas and uh, startups around the world in this part of the world. Very simple. The biggest. Yeah. Min Yeah. Yeah. And if, if it's not rocket science, it's just making sure. And and like uh, like Mark Pincus from uh, Ginza says, and uh, if your competition is doing something. Uh, I, I don't like him so much, but I like this line. This, this, is, the, uh, this is the gaming app, right? Yes, yeah. Jenga, Jenga is it? Zynga. Yeah. Zynga. Zynga, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he goes, in, uh, if your competition is doing something better, uh, copy it by the pixel and then <laughs> yeah, I mean, take your ego and shove it somewhere else, right? Okay. But I think over this here, the great opportunities we have is there are so many verticals that are still untapped. Oh, think, yeah, you're as big as what your vision is. You'll only attract talent as big as what your vision is. Uh, 
think of that magnitude and uh, and I think VCs will will appreciate it uh, will appreciate it so you still you would recommend for an entrepreneur to to dominate their their market and then start looking at the region and then potentially at the world so start but start with with dominating your own market or yes. would you feel like a better strategy would be okay we need to launch in, in in uae but in six months we have to be in saudi or so what's what's the recommendation on your end yeah, yeah um, i like to keep things simple uh, i'll go back to the original kind of lean startup eric Ries diagram right the learn the build learn measure right it's that triangle it's so the, uh, the lean startup yes yes uh, but uh, so I think that's kind of where I sit in terms of mindset on how to scale, uh, demonstrate local capability and success, or uh, be mindful and uh, scale at growth is very different from scale locally, right? Uh, and we claim we're a 450 million Arab population, but uh, doing business in Beirut is different from Kuwait, is different from Dubai, uh, hell, even in in Dubai versus Abu Dhabi, it's also different, right? That's true. Uh, that's in, in the same country. So I think be mindful and scale out growth is different when the culture really differs from one uh, one population to the other. Um, hire uh, or, or build a, a really great team as you scale. So always try to leave some room and space for growth for you to groom uh, champions as your team expands uh, be, you, be mindful of that yeah should you should you think of an exit from uh, from the early days I wouldn't honestly then it's not in your control or hands but I would do all the right things to build a company that lasts forever Who, uh, and and if you build that company you'll always be ready Right. Uh, if you don't take legal shortcuts, if you keep your books clean, if you put your governance in, in order, uh, if you select your investors wisely, execute on the strategy, vision, uh, start with a product, but maybe later on have one vision with multiple products, uh, scale properly and demonstrate your capability of, of scaling, have the right team. Any, I know it's a cliche, but what I mean by team is it's not just business and uh, technical skills. It's complementary skills. It's complementary experience. So the Lulu comes from an entrepreneurial uh, experience. Maybe having someone corporate who's a lot more disciplined is actually uh, appropriate for Lulu to balance yeah. her, her creativity. Maybe if I have someone who's uh, uh, who's just a modeling guy, modeling guy I mean on Excel, who knows his numbers, knows his shit very well, is is uh, is probably someone that uh, that I relate to better. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not the the function; it's the experience, complementary experience as well uh, that I would look for. But I think if you're mindful of that, you don't really need to worry about exiting. Uh, instead, if you really want to create a liquidity event for your shareholders, uh, and you're thinking as big as the region or multiple regions around the world, um, what's in your hand is IPO in the business. That's something... Outside of the region, though. Um, Yes, outside of the region, but I would also be uh, aware, I, I would be just conscious that there are many regional attempts right now for attracting and promoting local uh, startups to go public. Yani, I know our friends in Tadawud in Saudi, for example, are working on, uh, on a great initiative to like, support local companies uh, in Saudi or in the region. Uh, of scaling and uh, are being mindful of the listing requirements uh, to be a lot more lean for technology startups. There that would are be so helpful, by the way, to entrepreneurs in the region. Absolutely. The good thing is, 
an IPO is something you can decide how you're going to do, right? You don't need to wait for X and Y to actually uh, acquire you or start flirting or dancing around the thought to take a year, I don't know, maybe take two years, but, uh, but overall, I think an IPO liquidity event is a lot more uh, appropriate. It's, it's, it's great for founders, really. Well, the good thing about IPOs is uh, companies monopolizing or taking lead can actually uh, create a lot of uh, consolidation of M&A activities. But if I were today at a certain million dollar threshold of revenue and I, I plan to IPO in a year and a half, well, throughout the next uh, six months I would go on uh, a spree for uh, for acquiring uh, inorganic growth, uh, that will cause a lot of M&A activity to happen in the region. So I think it's it's quite necessary, uh, especially with the current circumstances, yani falling oil prices, COVID, uh, government deficits all over the region, uh, and the lira at ten thousand per dollar. <laughs> That's today. It might be tw it might be fifteen. Like by the time I publish this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very unfortunate. By the way, I know, I that's know. very very unfortunate. I know that we should also be. Yeah, again, despite these challenges, this is where an IPO and M and A or consolidation can really benefit. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Many, many great companies. Absolutely. Yeah, in, in Lebanon. There are there are great companies that are on the global map, not just on the regional map. On the on the startup scene. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, you have Adrami. Obviously, I interviewed Eli Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was referring to Eli actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a solid entrepreneur, though. He, you know, he's someone who's, you know, Adrami is his fifth business, so he's, he's someone who's. Uh, Who's who's been through that process quite a few times, so uh, it is a learning curve. Abd Aziz, when you, uh... someone like Ali is probably a lot more useful for a founder to sit down with, absolutely, than someone with a fact check, right? Absolutely, and then maybe that kind of triggered the first conversation we had. Absolutely, I think we need Ali, the Ali's, the Modassers, the the you, you know, uh, people that have. The few people that have had an exit, obviously, like uh, like uh, uh, Jabbar and and Fadi and 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 all of those to uh, to, to be to be making these uh, investments. Um, so you you've been you've you're one. You're, there's actually what, how many like maybe five. Let's say big uh, four or five big tech investment uh, exits in the region. Yes, yes. So, so, so Talabat was in 2015. That was, yeah, five years ago. That was yes. something. Did yeah. you, um, I, I think I, 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 I always wondered, like, the amount of confidence you, ha you need to have as a founder uh, uh, to, to, to kind of do this sort of negotiation and, uh, and, and get, these, uh, get these numbers. I mean, obviously, now you have Karim, which sort of broke all types of barriers. But at the time, in 2015, the only uh, uh, what do you call it, like uh, baseline you had was uh, Maktoub. Exactly. Yes, yes indeed. Well, I actually wrote about Maktoub when it exited. I was writing a newsletter, a quarterly newsletter for our customers in Talabat, and I I remember telling myself I have to write about this news, although it has nothing to do with the best sandwich or what new restaurants we had. But I still mentioned the Maktoub's exit on that quarter. Well, I think that's what really kind of also affected my mindset of thinking more uh, regional rather than just focusing on, on our local market. Nice. Uh, but, but to your point about confidence, we are an accumulation of our past experiences today. Yeah. We show, even to our loved ones, the side we want to show, right? So I'm sure we're not all saints or uh, angels, right? We all have our mistakes, but we choose what side to show uh, our loved ones, our colleagues, 
and our investors. صح. ف I think having your accumulated experience uh, with some with some scars that you've earned on the way uh, validates a lot of the bluffing you can get away with, right? And then at that time, يعني I got on a call immediately actually. Uh, with one of the first investors with uh, with Maktoub who said, this is what I want to do. I don't know you, but you seem to speak uh, a lot about what you've done and I and I want to take the same route. So I think in uh, having first-hand experience is good, but also investing your time with great founders who've gone through even more uh, experiences than you have will hopefully also maybe not get you 100% of the experience, but at least give you a lot more confidence in how you approach things. And and did the team... Uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I said, did the team at the time do all the negotiating or you had, uh, you had well, advisors or... Ahmed, uh, my partner, was leading Balabat uh, at, that, at that time. I was a non-exec back then. Yeah. But we did have an advisor as well. Okay. Uh, a third party advisor who was negotiating on behalf of the sellers uh, back there with, with the buyers. Okay. Unless there are so many other circumstances. So uh, I think what we did uh, in, in, uh, in the past, the, the exit, if, it mar- if the exit is a mark of success, then it's definitely not only hard work or being smart. Uh, the third component is people call it luck. Uh, some of us call it uh, being prepared. Some call it uh, market conditions. But I think whatever you call it, that element of luck is is uh, is also very important, right? And uh, the whole region was going through consolidation, and there was primarily one buyer. Uh, so well, that's when. A winner really takes all. But if you had a lion's share of that market, there was no one else but you to acquire. Yeah. And that's where today at Flowered, our revenue is actually higher than what we sold Talabat for. Uh, wow. Uh, higher yeah. than what you sold Talabat for? Or no, higher no, no, than uh, Talabat's revenue at the time? Talabat's revenue at the time, yes. Okay. Um, so if I think. And imagine in that, that was created over a period of nine years uh, versus what was created in flowered over two years and a half. Wow. So uh, this is how, how lucky we are, right? Uh, there are more internet users. COVID just gave us a, a head start for the next 10 years. Uh, I would say internet penet- e-commerce penetration. Um, the reference I have is from the U.S., But the previous uh, eight weeks, uh, e-commerce penetration is higher than the cumulative 10, 10 past years. Wow. So I think we've seen that uh, significantly in, uh, uh, in the region and more recently as well. We, we will see it here. I was speaking, uh, I interviewed uh, um, Ryan Karake. He works at Google. And he was saying that, the, you know, we are a region that leapfrogs. It takes us so long. to adopt something, but when we adopt it, we adopt it uh, fully. Right. And, uh, and and he was talking about like smartphone penetration, for example, but still, you know, he mentioned that there's 200 million people in the in the Arab world that still don't have access to internet. So uh, so there's still a big gap. It, it's okay, 250 is still a lot. Yeah, it's still a lot, that's true. And, that's and true. of those 200 million, I would probably say 50% are below 10 years old. But you're okay, don't worry. Probably. <laughs> Probably that's true. I I I, I love our chat. You uh, you uh, you're very open, honest. I I, I really admire that. You're uh, also the one more thing. You and I had a had a like a like a WhatsApp message about was the uh, your ad at Flowered. You did recently a Father's Day ad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. was really really cool and uh, and uh, and. And I said, uh, and I mentioned it to you, and you said, yeah, like fathers are, are underrated. <laughs> <laughs> are you underrated? You're a father of three? Father of three, yes, yes. And so is, fathership, is fatherhood underrated? 
uh, I think Father's Day is significantly underrated. So this is something we uh, uh, we like experimenting with in, in flowered, right? So at the lowest of your uh, of your chain of your value chain, uh, are the key functional kind of values. You always want to make sure you have the right product mix. You want to make sure you have the right pricing. You want to make sure you have the uh, the, the best value for money in terms of quality and pricing, uh, fastest turnaround time for an order, best technology, user experience, all of that is what everyone else competes on. This is basic, and you really want to score high and the best on it. Well, alhamdulillah, we think that we actually do. But beyond that functional uh, layer is how do you really self-actualize your gifting and and uh, occasions with your customers. How can you really see it mirroring the, the people? There's a great, uh, there's a great uh, chart by Bain. It's called Customer Value Assessment. So, uh, this is an exercise we do internally. Uh, I would encourage many people to actually look through it, especially for uh, yeah, any consumer-facing web and mobile apps. Um, uh, so when, when we do that, uh, we realize that people associate more with, uh, with their occasions. So we have with more there? With their? With occasions. Okay, okay. So, uh, for example, there are uh, birthdays happening every day, right? Why aren't we the best uh, go-to destination for that? Um, but there are also so many other occasions that we've experimented with. We've experimented last year with more than 60 occasions. Wow. So every week we have an occasion that we celebrate. And these occasions are all uh, public. The private ones are Lulu's birthday, where Aziz will send Lulu maybe something. Uh, the public ones are like Father's Day. Uh, it was one of those occasions that we experimented with. Uh, and we're happy in uh, many people actually followed us. So we were also... We try having that witty sense of humor. It was really good. It was really well done. <laughs> it was really well done. Right. Any any closing uh, remarks? Anything you'd like to uh, to end with? Any advice for entrepreneurs or even VCs that are listening? Um, I think the region overall has gone through a lot of uh, a lot of uncertainties with COVID. Right, there are many companies that are that have folded. Um, there are many funds that were uncertain to how uh, this effect or impact would be uh, long term on on the companies they're in. Uh, some companies are ending up consolidating. But I feel in uh, it's during these hard times uh, that that. These events bring the best of what's in you. So I think any resilient founders, VC funds, whatever, any those whom are resilient, who are any, who are defiant, independent, and really want to change the status quo, will make uh, will make it through and weather these uh, this storm. Uh, We've seen great companies, uh, honestly, pick up uh, who took advantage of, of the uh, huge e-commerce penetration increase that's happened. Who, uh, who I feel that in, in every, in all of these bad situations and whatever happens, there's always something good that you can come out of with. But, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm conscious, so I'm, I'm very grateful, honestly for what we've uh, achieved so far with Flower. And I think that, uh, and I think founders, generally speaking, uh, take advantage of these hard times. If it's not working, you need to close shop and move on. If, you, if this is your calling, then you really need to make the best out of it. And I, I truly believe, and then you'll make the best out of it. I think you still have another four or five companies in you. <laughs> you you're still you're still young. <laughs> I hope so. I still draw that five a.m. and I still play rude at eight. Thank you so much, Abdul Aziz. I loved this conversation, Didi. Thank you for taking the time. Sure, I really appreciate it.
Shukran Lulu, thank you for uh, hosting myself. Uh, thank you for hosting the, the other great uh, people you've had. I've, I've uh, learned from them firsthand and continue to really enjoy those conversations. Great. Well, I wish to see you in better conditions. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for, for everyone who's listening. Uh, this was episode eight of Conversations with Lulu. Uh, I would love it for you to subscribe to the uh, to the podcast on Conversations with Lulu on all the podcast players and also on my YouTube channel. I'd really appreciate it if you like the show to share it with your friends and uh, and comment and send me your feedback. If you want to sponsor the show, you can email me on lulu.chazen at gmail.com. Have a great day and stay safe, everyone.